Do you love God more than anything? Do you love God? Do you love God more than anything? Do you love God? Love Oh, my God. 
our focus this morning is on the word of God. The Bible says, Psalms 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And Psalms 119 verse 11 says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So ladies and gentlemen, today, let us meditate on his word. Let us focus on it and let us live out his precincts every day. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Grace Tabernacle. My name is Gary White Jr., or you may know me as Kashon, and I'm here to give everybody a lovely welcome on this blessed Sabbath day. Today we have a lot of fulfilled activities for everybody to see and for everybody to really get that wonderful praise of what God has done for us. So to begin, of course, I'm doing the welcome and opening prayer. Then after me, we're going to have children's story by our wonderful sister, Trisha. She's going to present a very nice story, get the kids nice and encapsulated and everything, show them a little pers different perspective on everything. We got something really nice lined up for you. And then after that, we're going to have Sister Carrie lead us in nice praise and worship. I want to hear everybody at home singing and having those live vocals. Everybody can sing. I just want to hear y'all sing nice and loud so y'all can really show the praise onto our Lord. And after that, we're going to have our intercessory prayer. We're going to have Elder Cutbirth Martyr lead us out on that. So we're going to take it nice and easy, thank God, and talk to our God together as one within this great tabernacle and overall church community. And after that, we're going to go to our scripture by Elder Carlton. And we're going to have that come from Galatians 1, Galatians 1, verses 15 through 17. And then we're going to have special music. And after that, we're going to have From Murderer to Minister, Part 3. Pastor is going on on a wonderful little service, and we're going to have Part 3. I don't know if this is the conclusion yet, but I want everybody to keep on paying attention. And as my shirt says, we are all blessed. And we need to capitalize on the blessings that God has continued to give us. Let's keep our spirits up and always thank God for the things that we have. And do not take anything for granted. And now we're going to have a nice opening prayer. Um, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come together as a family. We may be virtual, but we are always together as one. We're always here to worship you, Lord, and we will continue to do things all together. God, thank you for the blessings to help us not to forsake any of the small things that you're doing for us. We truly value all of the little blessings that you have given to us, Lord. And I will never and we will never take any of those things for granted. And Lord, we just ask for you to be with us throughout the service and that we'll always depend on you for the things that we need. Thank you again, Lord, for everything you've done for us. In your son's name I pray, amen. And everybody, please do not forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment on this video. We're going to reach everybody through this video because it's a wonderful video and it's a wonderful service. Blessings to everybody and everybody have a wonderful day. Out. Morning, Grace, and happy Sabbath. Today's children's story is about buried treasure. As John and Mary were walking their dog one evening, John noticed something poking out of the ground. Using a stick, he uncovered a heavy, old, rusty can. They carried the can back home and pried it open. Inside, they discovered the can was full of gold coins dated between 1855 and 1894. Using a metal detector, John and Mary found seven more coin cans containing more than 1,400 gold coins worth more than $10 million. 
Mary and John had been struggling to pay their bills. The, the answer to their difficulties had been right under their feet for years, Mary said. Many people today experiencing difficulties in life. They struggle to find answers in their most to their most important questions while the help they need is right there in the Bible. There was treasure right under John and Mary's feet for many years, but they hadn't thought to look for it. Boys and girls, don't make that mistake with the Bible. There is treasure in God's word more valuable than all the gold coins in the world. Take time to search the Bible, to study it carefully, and get to know the one who gave it to this world. You can find that in John 5, verse 39. As we live with God's word in your heart, you will grow to know him more and more. And as I leave you with this little prayer, dear Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the Bible so we can learn who you are and know how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Grace and friends. This morning, I invite you to join in and sing along with me. For anyone who has ever heard the term MV, there was a collection of songs that became a soundtrack of a generation. You might have had a book that looked like this, or there was an orange looking one. It's a sure way to combat negative thinking and particularly with this next song, which is going to be a mel about a melody that you can keep in your heart. Let's see if you remember this one. Come on. Some of you all were doing the other parts that go with this song too. I can't sing both of them at the same time. Okay. <laughs> In preparation for prayer, this next song was a way that we understood 
that we did need to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, but it asked us to whisper a prayer all day long. And the last verse, we started, we made a combination of everything, all the other verses. So just follow me with that, all right? Good morning, Grace family. Happy Sabbath. Um, as we uh, get ready for, for prayer, I wanted to um, share with you a verse here that Paul wrote to the uh, Philippians, um, one of his final admonitions to them in uh, Philippians chapter four. And I will read, his, I will read verses four to, um, to seven. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And I want to uh, uh, just remind you um, to keep this verse in your hearts as you as we pray today and as you go through this week uh, to remember that um, the peace of God which passeth all understanding will keep you through whatever challenges that you may face so as we let's bow our heads um, for a word of prayer <clears throat> eternal father and our God watch in heaven um, hallowed be your most holy name we come before your presence once again father at the end of another week and on another Sabbath day that you've given us where we can rest and lay aside the troubles of our, our daily lives to focus on worshiping you and fellowshipping with each other. Father, without this day, Lord, only you would know 
where we where our lives would have ended up. And we thank you, Father, that we have taken time to to worship and fellowship with each other. A lot of this time, we want, I want to stand in the gap on behalf of you. Uh, Father, among us, there are those who are grieving, uh, particularly um, Sister Hicks and her family. Uh, we know that uh, her mom passed away at the ripe old age of, uh, of um, 95. Father, we thank you, Lord, that they were able to, to spend time with her and that, um, <clears throat> that your spirit uh, continues to be with the family. Father, we ask that you'd, you'd help them that as they, as they grieve, that they'll grieve as, as individuals who have hope. Hope that they will see their mom, her mom, their grandmother, and, and relative um, once more. Uh, Father, there are many among us who are who are ill, uh, who need to need a healing hands from you, Father. We we know that uh, Brother Link, uh, who is suffering from, uh, who has to uh, dialysis regularly, Father, we ask that you give him the strength that he may be able to face those challenges each day, and that that, that at the end of it all, Father, that he could continue to give you the praise that as it as he um, goes through each one, that give you the praise that you have brought him through. We lift up Sister Sharma before you. Father, um, she's suffering from sickle cell and periodically um, she goes through crisis, which are quite intense in terms of the pain. But I do not fully understand um, what she goes through, but Lord, you do. And Father, we ask that you would, um, at this time, that you grant her some peace uh, and a break from, from the pain. But Father, on a more long term, we ask Lord, that you'd help her doctors to find a, a long-term solution that would help a lot to um, uh, move away from this life of pain and to, uh, into a, a life of, that is more comfortable uh, and manageable. We want to lift up uh, Sister Tasha before you um, uh, as she continues to bat battle um, the sinus infection, Lord, that you heal her and that you restore her back to health. And that at the end of it, Lord, she can look back and give you the praise. We know Lord Sister Shalene is also grieving the passing of a very close friend. Father, this, these periods are very painful. And Lord, there are many questions that, that will be asked. And Father, we ask that you would um, answer those questions in your time, but also that you would um, continue to give her the hope Lord, that she needs to, to keep moving forward. Lord, we lift up Sister Bird, Elder Bird, before you. We also lift up um, <clears throat> Pastor Leggett and his mom. Lord, we ask that you continue to, to be with them, that, that, that you give him the, the, the knowledge, the understanding, Lord, that he needs to take care of him, take care of his mother, and and, and also, Father, as he leads um, your your flock. Father, we want to lift up um, a CJ before you. Uh, Father, he's very excited about his promotion ceremony coming up. And Lord, we thank you that you have brought him through thus far. But it is a pleasure, Lord, to see how well um, he's, he's growing up, Lord. He has a desire to serve you and a love for you, Lord, that, that brings joy to not just us as a church, but especially to his parents. Father, we ask that you continue to be with all of our students. Father, we come into the end of the school year and the stresses that comes with that can be quite uh, significant. And we ask, Lord, that you grant them the knowledge the wisdom, Lord, to continue to persevere so that at the end they can look back and be proud of the work that they have done. We also ask, Father, for you a special blessing on each family in our church today. Lord, the devil is on a rampage trying to, to separate the family, for he knows that if he can do, do that, then he can have a, a powerful um, uh, negative impact on your church. And so, Father, we ask, Lord, for that you'd grant each family the knowledge, the wisdom, and the willingness that we need to serve you and to serve you the right way. We also ask for that you'd be with our young children, um, Father, and also that you'd be with their parents, and as they raise them, that they'll raise them in a way that would um, see them growing to understand you and to love you better. We also ask a special prayer on behalf of our young people, Father, they are our future, they are our today, and we ask that you continue to strengthen them. Um, Speak to them in a way, Lord, that they would understand, Father, that they would continue to rem remember the lessons that they were taught growing up, and that they would not stray from it. As we go through this, through the rest of this Sabbath, we ask, Father, that you'd be with 
uh, past as he preaches and with us as we listen, that we will gain the message from it and it will be a means of drawing us closer to you. And as a result of that, um, others may be drawn closer to you because of us. Guide us, Father, protect us. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Yeah, I'm there. Happy Sabbath and good morning, Grace family. Today I am here to read the scriptures for you. And um, the scripture reading will be taken from Galatians 1, reading verses 15 through 17. And it reads, But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, it did not rush out to consult with any human beings, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away to Arabia, and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Here in the reading of God's holy word, pray you have a blessed Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, grace.
us out there. We are absolutely delighted to have you uh, to be worshiping with us this beautiful 22nd day of the month of May. What a beautiful day to be alive. I am continuing our series entitled From Murderer to Minister, the Transformation of Saul of Tarsus. And we continue with part three of this series. And so without further ado, bow your heads with me as we um, call on the name of the Lord. Father God, I ask that you would be with me today as I deliver your word. As always, I ask that I might be a conduit through which your blessings will flow to your people. As Elder Mosley used to say, warm from glory. May the saints be edified. And may you, my Lord, be glorified. In Jesus' name I ask it. For his sake, I pray. Amen. 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 From, from murderer to minister, part three, the transformation of Saul of Tarsus. The once mighty defender of the Jewish faith the intimidator has just been intimidated. The bully has been bullied. The one who days before was seemingly all powerful is now powerless. Saul has been knocked down and humbled. He is confused. He is dazed. He doesn't know what's going on. He might not even know where he is. And to add injury to insult, he's blind. He's alone with his thoughts. He's trying to make sense of the last three days. But how do you make sense of that which doesn't make sense is the question. I'm sure that was going through his mind. Theologically, his world has been turned upside down. You see, he'd been taught that Christianity was a cult, that Christ was a fraud, a fake, an imposter. He was informed that Christianity had to be eliminated, that it was a danger to the established Jewish religion. And yet, that same Jesus, the God and savior of Christianity appears to him, knocks him off his horse and charges him with persecuting the Lord himself, the one he thought was a fraud. It didn't make sense. And while still in the midst of that confusion, Ananias, who had been handpicked by Christ to minister to Saul, appears and addresses him because it's time for his new journey to begin. It is time for his new birth to take place. So to be clear, ladies and gentlemen, to be clear, We're still talking about how Christ transforms us from the worst of us into the best of us. How Christ transforms us from the worst of us into the best of us. So how did Christ transform Saul from murderer to minister? Let's take a look. The Bible says that Ananias goes to Saul. Scripture says this, Acts 9, 17. 
that a nice went found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and that you might be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. After that, he ate some food, regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. And check this out. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is indeed the son of God. What's the key word here? The key word is immediately. Without delay. Immediately he began to testify to the Jews about his experience with his Lord. Immediately he began to minister to others by telling them about his personal experience with Christ. Notice that he did not have an extensive Bible studies teaching him about the 2300 day prophecy or the state of the dead or about the second coming of Christ. Uh, so, here's the question. Did Saul find a church to attend and then just attend that church for years while sitting in a pew doing nothing? No. Did he join a congregation and get to know the people and just sit in the pews and chill for years? No. Did he attend the church and just blend in and do what everybody else was doing? No. Did he return home and live a normal life? Absolutely not. So what happened once his eyes were opened? My favorite author, Ellen White, blessed with the prophetic gift that God says um, in Ephesians 4 that would remain in the church until Jesus comes, until the second coming of Christ. And, and, and because of that prophetic gift, God allowed her, she was privileged to receive information from the Lord that, that shines a light on scripture. Now, nothing supersedes scripture. Scripture is the greater light. There's nothing on the level with that. But in the book, Desire of Ages, pages 121, page 121, paragraph three, paragraph one, rather, here's what she says. After his baptism, Paul broke his fast and remained certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And straightway, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God of God. Straightway means immediately, without delay, without hesitation. So, continuing, in the last two messages, um, part one, I shared one message with you. Last week, I shared, I mean, I shared two points with you. Last week, I shared two. First week, part one, I shared one point. Um, in part two, I shared two points, two or three points last week. And so now I am beginning with point four. So here we go. We're continuing uh, in this series. Here's point four. At the beginning of our conversion experience, we're talking about how Christ transforms us from the worst of us, which is where we are when he finds us, when we accept him as our savior and how he transforms us into the best of us by the mercy and the grace of God. At the beginning of our conversion experience, Christ requires us to testify and witness to others about what Christ has done for us. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that the Lord wasted no time in having Saul minister to others by sharing his testimony. Why? Because no one can gainsay your testimony. No one can contradict your testimony. 
So Saul began to witness and testify immediately. Without delay, uh, he began to share his testimonies with others. Why? Because there were individuals in those synagogues that needed to hear it. Far too often, people join the church and sit down and do nothing as if they are waiting for a personal invitation from Christ to get up and get busy. No, ladies and gentlemen, a ministry for Christ is to begin the instant we accept him as our savior. You don't need to understand the 2300 prophecy to share your testimony. You don't need to understand and explain the prophecies in Daniel 2, 3, 7, 11, and 12. You don't need a, a degree in theology or degrees in theology like I have to share with others what Christ has done for you, how he's changed your life, how he has improved your life. You don't need any special training for that. You don't need to be a Bible worker or an evangelist to do that. You just need to share with others what Christ has done for you. So if you're sitting down doing nothing, it's time to get up and get busy. If you're silent about your Lord and Savior, it is time to speak up. Can I get a witness in Israel this morning? Saul immediately shared his testimony with anyone who would listen. In fact, he sought out Jews because he knew that his experience would inspire and motivate some of them. And he was right. Saul's testimony was incredibly effective. Again, my favorite modern author, says this, she says, boldly he declared Jesus of Nazareth to be the long looked for Messiah who died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day after which he was seen by 12 and by others. And last of all, Paul added, he was seen of me also. So ladies and gentlemen, what happened when he began to share his testimony? Here is what happened. His arguments for prophecy were so conclusive and his efforts were so manifestly attended by the power of God that the Jews were confounded and they were unable to answer him. They had no answer for him. The Jews could not stand toe to toe with him. They couldn't counteract his testimony. He, it was too powerful. They had no argument. It, because it was filled with the Holy Ghost because he had had an experience with God and he was now sharing that experience which they didn't have with Christ because they had summarily rejected him. So he went where they were from synagogue to synagogue he didn't wait for them to come to him. He went from synagogue to synagogue, from city to city, because he knew that his people needed to hear his testimony and his experience. And the Jews were blown away by his testimony. The Jewish leadership, who had just days before were incredibly proud of him, could not now refute his testimony and his argument. But how could they? It was his testimony. So immediately Saul begins to share that he was on his way to Damascus to arrest those that he was standing in front of now. And the Lord the Lord, the one he didn't believe in just days before, showed up in his life, changed his course of direction, gave him a testimony that was so powerful that the lives of his listeners were changed just by hearing his incredible story. And just by hearing his story, it inspired hope in others. His story alone inspired others to, stay, to take their stand for Christ. 
His story was a game changer. His experience was a game changer. His testimony was a game changer. What about yours and mine? Are we sharing our testimony with others? We should. Why? Because other people need to hear it. They need to hear that Christ is still in the saving business. They need to hear that Christ is still in the healing business. They need to hear that Christ is still in the business of hearing and answering their prayers. They need to hear that Christ has all the solutions to the problems that they are facing in life. And they need to know that if Christ has done it for you and me, that he can do it for them. They need to know that life change is still possible. So drug addicts need to know that they can kick the drug, the, the drug, the, the drug habit. Prostitutes need to know that they can come off the streets and clean up their lives. Dope fiends need to know that they can stop putting that mess in their arms. Alcoholics need to know that they can that, that they can they can put the bottle down. Those who are addicted to cigarettes need to know that they can conquer that habit. Those who are addicted to pornography, like I was, need to know that they can stop watching filth and be pure in mind. They need to know it. And the best sermon is a lived one. Amen. Amen. They need to know that there's something within me that that holdeth the rain. There's something within me that banishes pain. They need to know that I've got something within me. It's called the Holy Ghost. Amen. And if, if you've accepted Christ as your savior, then you have a testimony. You have something to say and somebody needs to hear it. Will you heal from a life-threatening illness? Somebody needs to know that. Have you fallen asleep at the wheel as it was headed for a major, a major head-on collision and suddenly, out of nowhere, a still small voice said, wake up. And you woke up just in time and turned the wheel and averted disaster. I've done that more times than I can even imagine. By the grace of God, because of that voice, I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that while I was in the world drinking, smoking, smoking dope, partying in high school, I was a D and F student. <laughs> I was a D and F student. I remember get having report cards seven classes, four Fs, three Ds, multiple times, or any combinations, or any combination of Fs and Ds. Sometimes there were four, um, sometimes there would be five Ds, two Fs, or uh, five, or, or five, or whatever, whatever it was, it was Ds and Fs. Never got an A in my life. From junior high to high to 12th grade, not one in my life. Not one. I was so afraid in high school because I was playing football. And, and for me, for me, 
High school was not about learning. High school was about playing sports. And I was all city in football. And loved it. Ran track. Outdoor, indoor. Played baseball in 10th grade. School was about sports. And I was afraid that because my grades were horrible, that I was going to be kicked off my teams. I should have been as an incentive. I should have been. Maybe I would have discovered in high school that I had some brains, but I didn't know I had any brains. And I remember we were about to graduate and um, we had received our ranking in class. There were almost 400 students in the class, in my graduating class, about 380. And I remember we were in the cafeteria and my girlfriend came up to me and she says, what's your ranking? And I said, 360 something. She said to me, you ain't done nothing. <laughs> and she was right. For me, there was no affinity between anything I was learning in school and anything I was going to do after school. So it didn't mean anything to me. So I never applied myself. It was not until I got to Oakwood College, now university, and God had a calling on my life that I, re that I, that I realized I had brains. My first, my first semester at Oakwood, January 1977. 1977. Four classes, one A, two Bs, and a C. My second semester, spring quarter, not semester, we won the quarter system. Spring quarter, 1977. Four classes, three A's, one B. Fall quarter, fall quarter, 1977. Five classes, four A's, one B. And my B was in music. I had a 3.94 GPA. And I came in an academic probation. Why? Because now Christ had a calling on my life. He said, you are somebody. Amen. So ladies and gentlemen, you have a testimony, so tell it. So how does Christ transform us from where we were to where he wants us to be is the question. Uh, my second and, and my last point is this. Once converted, Christ requires our undivided attention to educate us in the word of God because we can't be so winners without that education. So let's be clear, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to, you don't have to master, you don't have to have a master's degree in theology to tell your testimony. But to become an effective soul winner, there's something about the word of God that you must know. And make no mistake about it, every one of us has been called to duplicate ourselves and win souls for Christ. Every one of us. And to do that, we must know something about the word of God. After all, after all, how can we invite people into something we don't know anything about? So the first thing I want you to know is this, to become the students of the word that we need to be, there are, there are a couple of steps involved that we need to take. I'm gonna share two of these steps with you as it has to do with knowing and understanding the word of God. Share two, two steps with you today. Step number one, we need to set time aside to study the word of God on a daily basis. We need to set time aside for the study of the word of God daily. So here's the question. Is this what happened to Saul? Let's find out. Galatians 1.15. Saul says, before, um, even before I was born, 
God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Before he was born, the call was made. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news to Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away into Arabia. I went to Arabia and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Here's what Ellen White says about this experience, about Saul's experience. Here in the solitude of the des desert, Saul, Paul, had ample opportunity for quiet study and meditation. Jesus communed with him and established him in the faith, bestowing upon him a rich measure of wisdom and grace. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord needed to re-educate him in the word of God. The Lord needed his full attention. The master didn't want him to be distracted. So, so when he began, here's what happened. He began to preach and teach in Damascus immediately after his eyes were opened and and but 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 the Jews were so angry that they couldn't dissuade him that opposition rose up and so what God then did is to send him into Arabia so that he could spend quiet time alone with Saul in Arabia in the desert where there were no distractions Can you say quiet time with Christ? And not only, not only was this the practice of Saul, but I want you to know that it was the practice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as well. Check this out. Ellen White in the book Desire of Ages, page 259. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Says this. He applied himself diligently to a study of the scriptures, for he knew them to be full of, talking about Christ now, he knew them to be full of invaluable instruction. He was faithful in the discharge of his duties, and the early morning hours, instead of being spent in bed, often found him in a retired place, searching the scriptures and praying to his heavenly father. In all who are under the training of God is to be a revealed a life that is not in harmony with the world, its customs, or its practices. And everyone needs to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speaking to the heart. When every other voice is hushed and in quietness we wait before him, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. That's why we need to go into our personal Arabias. He bids us be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46.10 here alone can true rest be found, and this is the effectual preparation for all who labor for God. Amid the hurrying throng and the strain of life's intense activities, the soul that is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace. The life will breathe out fragrance and will reveal a divine power that will reach man's hearts. So that's why we need to get up in the morning or whenever, and we need to spend quiet time alone with God. So how is it possible? How is it possible? It, that Christ himself, who was God, would get up bright and early in the morning to spend time with his little, to, to, to spend time with his father. How is it possible that Christ 
sent Saul into Arabia to spend quiet time alone with Christ, where his mind is not distracted, where it's just Christ and Saul. How is it possible that these two individuals are the greatest evangelists that the world has ever seen? And that was their practice. And yet, one of the first things we do every morning is get up and break our necks to run out the door for those who are, of us who are still working or for those of us who punch a clock. One of the first things we do is get up and run up, break our necks getting out the door to meet man's schedule. and not spend quiet, alone time with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What is our Arabia time that we have set aside to study his word? To pray, to meditate on his goodness and to hear his voice. When is that time? How do we make time for everybody else in the everything else except the one who was murdered and hung on a tree for us. How much time are we devoting to our creator as opposed to the time we give to everybody else and everything else? How is it possible that the God of the universe is begging to spend time with us and we're too busy. How is that possible? The song says, I missed my time with you. Those moments together, I need to be with you each day. And it hurts me when you say, you're too busy, busy trying to serve me. But how can you serve me when your spirit's empty? There's a longing in my heart, wanting more than just a part of you. It's true. I miss my time with you. Let's do better, people. Let's set a schedule. Let's tell Jesus, I, I do it. I've done it. I do it. I say, Lord, I want to spend time with you tomorrow morning. Wake me up at 6 a.m., 5 a.m., whatever the case, whatever it is. Wake me up at such and such a time. And I guarantee you at that time, the Holy Ghost is going to tap you on your shoulder. Now, now, you may turn over and not get up. But I guarantee you, he will tap you on your shoulder at exactly the time you set. I don't care what time it is. Why? Because he says, I miss my time with you. Ecclesiastes 3 says, there are fresh mercies that God gives every morning. When your mind is fresh and uncluttered. So set a time. Tell Holy Ghost to wake you up and then go into your personal Arabia time with Christ and watch how he blesses you. Amen. 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 The next step in the process of studying God's word is incredibly important as well. 
And so I want you to understand that we must do eisegesis, we must do exegesis when we study the word and not eisegesis, exegesis, compound Greek word, ek, out of, okay? Um, out of, gesato, ek, exegesis. That means we take out, we pull from the word that which is there exegesis which tra we extrapolate from the word that which is there we don't do eisegesis which means we read into the word that which is not there like dispensationalists do when they talk about the rapture it's not there like first day folk do when they try to prove that christ changed the sabbath from saturday to sunday it's not there that's eisegesis. So what did Paul do? So the Lord says this. So here's what we're gonna do. Step two, when we approach God in his word, we must empty ourselves of our preconceived ideas and opinions and accept God's word at face value. That's what we need to do. We need to empty ourselves of our preconceived ideas and opinions. We need, to, we need to divest ourselves and come with a clean slate to the word of God and accept God's word at face value. So what did Paul do? Ellen White says, Acts of the Apostles, page 125, paragraph three. He emptied his soul of the prejudices and the traditions that, that had hitherto shaped his life and received instruction from the source of truth. He emptied his soul of all the traditions, all the stuff that, 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 his, that his educators and his teachers had taught him all those traditions, he emptied himself. He put that to the side. He sat down with the word of God. He said, Lord, teach me, educate me. And he received instruction from the source of truth itself. So Saul emptied himself. He divested himself of all those other ideas that might conflict with the word of God. He wanted nothing to conflict with the word of God. He only wanted to be taught that which was in the word and nothing else. He was born Jewish and he became a strict Pharisee. And as a Pharisee, they had all these rules and these strict rules and regulations because they thought that they could keep God's law on their own aside from the Holy Ghost. They thought they could earn salvation through their own efforts and behaviors. And they thought that if they, if they, if they overcame this, if they overcame that, they thought that they could achieve perfection all on their own without God. And he had to lay all of those ideas, those false notions, he had to lay them to the side. He wanted nothing to taint his understanding of the word of God. He only wanted to be influenced by Christ and nothing else. He tossed his tradition. He got rid of his religious upbringing. He sacrificed all of it so he could start with a blank slate. Today, we have members who come to the word of God having already embraced all kinds of theories and preconceived ideas and opinions, and they end up losing their way and they're gonna end up losing salvation if they don't make it about faith. We have, we have, we have folks who embrace the notion of the original black Jews. There's this movement going around that black folk are, there's this bandwagon that, that, that people who look like me are jumping on the bandwagon of. That, the, that, that black folk, Africans were the original Jews. Okay, well, all right. Oh, okay. 
but it keeps going. It keeps going. And it keeps going. And every time, almost every time I've encountered one of these individuals, talking about Adventists, who have jumped on this black Jewish movement, they end up being fanatical about black stuff. Now, look, I'm, I'm African-American. I love my people. And, and we've come through a tremendous struggle and we're still coming through. But we are not to put down anybody else. We're not superior to anybody else. We're not better than anybody else. And when these individuals go down that road, they end up leaving the Adventist church. They get hung up on all of this blackness and they end up leaving the church. And they end up on a slippery slope headed nowhere. I received phone calls from individuals asking me about the lost books of the Bible. Lost books of the Bible? Are you serious? You're concerned with the lost books of the Bible. Why don't you start keeping the 66 that we know about instead of worrying about maybe some that, 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 that you believe have gotten lost? And there aren't any that God wanted you to have in the canon that have been lost. Yes, there were books that were written, some by the prophets, right? That did not get included in the canon. But God didn't, in, didn't, didn't intend them for them to be included in the canon. Every book that God wanted in the canon of the Old Testament, 39 in the Old, 27 in the New, everything he wanted in there is in there. So start keeping those and stop worrying about that which is not in it. How about that for starters? Are you serious? Lost books of the Bible. Lost knowledge, lost truth. You're not even keeping the stuff that's revealed. You searching after lost, uh, lost treasure. And see, that's why Christians end up saying stuff like, I don't, I, you know, I don't see why we, yeah, right, right, right. I get it. I get it. You said it absolutely right. You don't see. Why? Because blind folk can't see. Too busy listening to the wrong folk, reading the wrong books, watching the wrong stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to empty ourselves of all of that stuff. I'm intentionally being redundant. Everything God wanted you to know in scripture is in scripture. Empty your mind. Come to the word of God with a clean slate. Don't come to the word with all your ideas and opinions about what you think it means. Sit down, be quiet, and let God teach you. He said, be still and know that I, I'm God, not you. I'm all knowing, not you, not me. When you're in your private Arabia, it's his classroom. Have sent, we need to have sense enough to let the God of the universe teach us when we sit at his feet in his classroom. We wouldn't dare go into a, a classroom and try to teach him and try to teach that teacher, male or female. We wouldn't dare do that. So why do we do it with God?
We're not there to educate him. We sit at his feet so that he can educate us. Saul became a powerhouse because he learned the word of God. And here's what I want to say to you. We need to, we need to read his word. And scripture says that we need to meditate it on it day and night. Now, I'm not talking about transcendental meditation. I'm not talking about yoga. I'm talking about meditating. I've started a process of getting up in the morning and just and just and just following God's word. Just following his word. What did he say? Be still and know that I'm God. I started a process of, of having my devotion. And, and and God is talking to me through his word. And then I, I go through a meditation process where I'm just sitting there and I'm just and I'm just thinking and contemplating about what I read and I'm sitting and I'm silent or I may be laying down and I'm silent and I'm saying to God, God, whatever you want me to know, share it with me. I'm not talking, I'm quiet because you said be still and know that I'm God. Because I want God to talk to me. I want to hear his voice. And I can't hear his voice when I'm talking. Because all y'all know I'm loud. So I need, to, I need to be quiet. I need to be still. Because I want to hear his voice. I've begun to inculcate that into my practice. And I believe God's taken me somewhere. Saul became a powerhouse because he learned the word of God. He was re-educated by Christ and by Christ directly and the Holy Ghost. And the effect was immediate. Check this out. All who heard him were amazed they said, isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, they asked? And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in, the, in Damascus couldn't, def, couldn't refute his proof that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. After a while, because the Jews, they couldn't dissuade him, they couldn't contradict him, and they plotted to kill him. That's Satan's MO. If he can't silence you, he will try to kill you. They were watching for him day and night at the city gate so they could murder him, but Saul was told about their plot. So during the night, some of the other believers lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the city wall. In the city wall. Verse 28, we jump down to 28. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem. So he, go, he ultimately goes to Jerusalem. He meets the apostles for the first time. And he begins to preach the word of God boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. Why? Because they couldn't gainsay his testimony. They couldn't contradict his message. They couldn't refute his argument. They were too powerful. It was, they were based on truth, not tradition. And when the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him to Tarsus, his hometown. The church then, check this out. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria, and it became stronger. The church became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord and with the encouragement of the Holy Ghost. It also grew in numbers because the individuals like Saul, they were sharing their testimony about what Christ had done for them. Amen. Amen. Why was he so powerful? As I prepare to close, why was his ministry so effective? It's because he spent 
time with Christ and he spent time in the word. Has God determined that you are the next Saul? Are you the next game changer for the people of God? Are you? As I close, in order for us to be what Christ wants us to be for him, we must spend quiet time with him. And we must spend quiet time in his word. There are no ifs, there are no ands, there are no buts. Ladies and gentlemen, most of us can do better. And most of us should do better. Someone out there is waiting for us to share our testimony with them. Someone out there is waiting for us to share our knowledge and our understanding of the word of God, which changes lives with them. So like Saul, let's go and change the world by the mercy and the grace of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, help us to establish our own personal Arabias. Help us to establish to establish our own personal quiet times with you. Just us, just you. No distractions, no televisions, no tablets, no cell phones, no family, no friends. Just us, just you. And then after we read your word, scriptures, scripture says we must meditate on it day and night. Scripture says be still. And know that I'm God. Be quiet and let me talk to you. Let me communicate with you. Teach us how to do just that. And then transform us from where we are into into the mighty men and women of God that you want us to be. And when you do that, we will be careful to give you the glory, the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name I ask it. For his sake I pray. Let the church say, amen, 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 amen. From minister, from murderer to minister, Part three. Next week, I will conclude uh, this particular series with part four. Um, I encourage you to come join us. I encourage you to see yourself in these messages. I encourage you to see where you are on that continuum. From the first time we accept Christ as our savior, ongoing. Where are we in the, on the continuum? And if you like, if you're enjoying this series, whether you are a member or non-member, it doesn't matter. I'm asking that you do two things, a couple of things. You're on our Facebook page. So like it, share it with others. Amen. And also let us know in the chat if you appreciate the message, the messages that you're receiving. I would personally appreciate that. And finally, for those of us returning our tithes and offerings. If you do so in person, I encourage you to continue to do that um, at the appropriate time. And for those 
who do so online, I uh, encourage you to do that as well. And we are grateful for your continued um, support of the church. Uh, we had a meeting um, with the leadership of the Allegheny East Conference and um, Elder Lawrence Martin did a presentation and he thought that 2021 um, was going to conclude with us being deeply, deeply in the hole financially. And he shared much to his, much to, to his delight that we weren't nearly um, um, as in the red as he thought we were going to be by the mercy and the grace of God. So that's to the that's to the testimony to the saints of God being faithful and diligent. I thank you. I thank all of you. Let's continue to do exactly that. Amen. And so now I invite I invite you I invite you to come and to participate with us in our fellowship. Um, and so we are going to make that transition. And so I'm going to invite you to transition to our fellowship site and I will meet you on the other side. Amen. I'll see you then. Be blessed. Opportunity, Lord, to praise your name. 